Hello, I'm Meredith Plackle. This is Don Feaster, and we're here as part of the oral history for mycology project, and we're going to interview Greg Benito in a minute. And I just want to say that we're here on the University of Florida campus in Gainesville, Florida, Hilton Hotel on the campus. The date is the 12th of July, 2022. So. Great. Well, First thanks. Question. Thanks for coming, Greg. No, thanks for having me and doing this. Living. Uh, um, I, I I guess the first time I ever saw Greg was at, at Duke, uh, and then soon after playing music. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk about your early life. Yeah. Uh, where were you born? That kind of thing. Was your family interested in fungi? Do they approve of your profession? Do they understand it? So. Kind of how you got into it too. Yeah, right. So, so it's all yours. Yeah, well, I was born in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and um, but I, I, I was only there for the first three years of my life. Don't remember too much of it, except a little door in my parents' closet that went upstairs, oh. you know, and uh, into the attic. But uh, and then we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, where I grew up. Oh, so you you went you went to school close to home. Um, I went to school in Appalachian State, uh, is where I went to my undergraduate, at, um, and uh, in I was into I was into plants mostly. Uh, How in the world did a guy get interested in plants when he was young? Yeah, well, I, I was a mischievous fellow, and uh, and I I got in trouble, believe it or not, uh, do, pulling pranks on people, and uh, part of my um, uh, penalty was to volunteer at the uh, Natural History Museum, you know. So I did community service there, you know. Just, just for my uh, my parents said you got to do something to to right your wrongs. And uh, we've it, never interviewed anyone who had to no. do do science as community service. That's pretty neat. Yeah, I was lucky. I loved it, and actually, um, it uh, it got me in with the, the junior curators. They were called. And um, we uh, take care of all of the, the herp, herp, you know, uh, alligators, snakes, um, reptiles. And then, uh, and then every Friday they'd have, uh, you know, natural history sharing. Someone would come in and talk about uh, something to do with uh, animals or plants or natural history because they were the curators there. We'd um, invite the public and we would show off all the animals we'd take care of. You know, we'd raise crickets for the the snakes or, or, and, um, and frogs and salamanders. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'd have field days. So I remember uh, you know, collecting the leaves from the trees in my yard and IDing and the trees uh, in my backyard. And then I started to really uh, yeah, kind of make sense of the, 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 the plant life around me. Um, did you ever notice a fungus in all of this outside work? I noticed the fungi. I remember with this group we went to Bailey's and I remember noticing some of the um, um, sarcoscypha. I remember now. I didn't know what it was then, but uh, fruiting in the rainforest. And uh, I mean, I noticed fungi. I was inter interested in fungi a little bit, but uh, not, as, not, as, not, not as much until I went to college. And I took a mycology course at App State. At App State, yeah. Coleman McClanahan yeah. had just arrived, and I took her class. And she uh, was Ron Peterson's student, she, wasn't she? Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So she had that strong uh, connection, and she was, um, you know, she, she was a great teacher, and um, and uh, you know, kind of got me into mycology. I did a, re I was interested in medicinal plants, and so for her class, I did my. Re my project on uh, well medicinal fungi, and I focused a lot on Ganoderma. And then she she asked, "Hey, would you like to do an independent study? Uh, we could we could try growing Ganoderma." And, um, and I, yeah, every college kid wants to grow mushrooms, <laughs> uh, so I grew uh, medicinal mushrooms. And then uh, and then she asked if I would TA her course, and you know it really uh, you know, spark opened my eyes. Um, well, there must have been something that caught her eye. <laughs> you know, Your maybe, future looked good. Yeah, maybe so. I, I, I was, uh, I was, yeah, I was very, very happy to to have that experience because uh, we had to take different different uh, organismal classes, um, and so the mycology opened my eye. Uh, the symbiosis lecture, particularly, was like, 
I remember learning about ectomycorrhizae and just being fascinated by this, these interactions. Uh, and, I, and I still am. Uh, sure. And the, and the plant side of that uh, comes into it too. You know, your background in plants and being able to identify and then looking at the fungi that they're associated with. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. It's and can you tell us a little bit more about her? The reason I ask is someone wrote the other day and said we ought to interview her. And I said, you know, I haven't seen her at a meeting in a long, long time. But she was a very good teacher. She was a phenomenal teacher. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, she expected a lot from her students. But, uh, you know, she, we'd go out in the field and she'd carry the tradition with bagels in the morning and get us, you know, get us to the field. Um, we'd do a lot of collecting. And, um, um, you know, I, yeah, w what about her? I, I think she's still at App State. But I, th I think she didn't get tenure, and, um, and then they, they hired her back to teach because they needed a, a, a teacher. And, um, but I don't it really... It like if she was so good at it, they did well. She was, she was phenomenal, and the students loved her. Um, yeah, and, uh, and she put a lot into it. I mean, that was... I don't know what the expectations are at, these, at the small teaching schools. You'd, you'd think that that would be a high you know, the, yeah. the, the focus, but, uh, you know. I was at one, they wanted everything, grant papers. They want grants, papers, and, yeah. and excellent teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's exactly. a lot to ask. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, so, okay, so then you finished at App State. I finished at App State, and I was, uh, I was torn between uh, my, mycology and uh, ecology, uh, which, which I was interested in because I'm uh, kind of generally a generalist, I, you know, I, I like a lot of different things and I was, I was a little nervous about, uh, you know, going for a, straight into a PhD, I, you know, I didn't know, I remember I went out to visit Joey Spadafore, you know, we talked about projects, it was, you know, AMF, AMF and grapes was a, was a potential project and I was almost, uh, yeah, I ended up doing a master's degree, though. I went to UGA, to the Institute of Ecology, um, uh, working with um, Bruce Haynes and Dave Coleman on nitrogen cycling in forests. Ecology is a little, I, I felt it was, um, it could, I could get my different interests interwoven in the, in the framework of ecology. Um, and I've become a little bit of a uh, you know, fungal ecologist you know, oh, in, yeah. in, in some degree. So, yeah, so um, Dave Porter was there, though. I always uh, kept my, myself, uh, you know, close to the fungi. So we had a, a fungus club. We made a, I made a little uh, brochure for the uh, botanic gardens of some of the different fungi you can see on your hikes through the woods. Uh, we put some of these uh, medicinal mushrooms in the ethnobotany garden, uh, which was 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 kind of and that was as a master's student. That was as a master's student, just on the side. Yeah, that had nothing to do yeah. with my research. Okay. Um, and uh, and I went to Masmic, you know, and that's I met Redis and Orson Miller came down, and I remember Kathy Aim. I met her the first time, and uh, well, Tim James was in uh, Dave Porter's lab at the at the time. So Tim's always been kind of my uh, you know kind of my big brother, as I uh, you know I went to I went to Duke. Tim was there. I went to Michigan, you know, Tim, Tim, Tim was there. He's nearby. He's like, you know, he's <laughs> following me around. Have you seen that ad about using a, 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 a browser that, that nobody's looking over your shoulder? I, I think that's yeah. really a cute ad. Tell them what ad's going on right now. So, so anyway, I, I just want to say about MASMAC. Do you know what MASMAC is? The acronym. The Mid-Atlantic States Mycological Consortium. I don't, I don't, yeah, I guess I don't yeah. know completely. Yeah, mycological, I don't know either, but but um, I'm new to MASMAC, but it's really a great group, I, I think. Uh, it was a, this time jo Julia Kerrigan had it in, at Clemson, and um, I had it one year, actually, the first year I moved to to South Carolina and didn't know anything. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do is put together a meeting when I didn't even know a place to collect. But anyway, uh, it's you know, a great society. Yeah, there's always, a, it's a spring meeting, so it's kind of like the uh, the Southeast or 
or Mid-Atlantic states, um, yeah. chapter of MSA, and they do this, and the, there's always a Morel for a, sometimes we find Morels, yeah. you know, but there's Blood little. It's found this year. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's fun to get out in the field with fellow mycologists. It's a great place for students to present a paper. Yeah, that was the first place that I, well, uh, we presented on our project and Orson was very supportive, you know, Mushrooms for the Masses, I still remember the, the title, and we had undergrads wow, that's involved. that's a great title. Yeah, and, and uh, but, uh, but, yeah, but that's where I met Ritas, and uh, when, I, when I finally decided to go back uh, for a PhD after spending a few years away from academia, you know, I thought. So what did you do in between? Uh, in between, well, I, I, I met my, my wife, that, you know, my current wife, you know, uh, only, only wife. But I, <laughs> your, first wife. your first my wife. Your first wife. My first wife, my wife. Uh, you know, she wasn't my wife at the time, but she was living in New Mexico. So uh, she had come. I, I did my master's degree at the Coweta uh, LTER site, mm -hmm. um, and she had come to do some videography uh, at Coweta, and, um, and we hit it off. So I moved, after I graduated, I moved to New Mexico. Okay. I worked at the LTER um, office. Um, working on sensor technologies, like how do you sense the environment? Um, so I got to go to lots of different national labs, um, Imbari and uh, Jet Propulsion Lab and Woods Hole, and say, hey, what's, what's the coolest technologies you guys are using? What are the limitations? And the part of this was to do the, the groundwork for the NEON mm -hmm. Observatory, yeah. you know, how do you instrument the environment? Um, and this was right, uh, you know, during 9/11, uh, um, and actually it became really, a, 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 you know, there was a lot of national interest in how you do this surveillance for. Uh, so I remember being part of the uh, multi-crisis consortium. You know, any signal, any scale, anywhere. You know, going to D.C., they wanted to know about, you know, material science and and how do you like sound. Uh, light, physical things are pretty easy to measure. We're pretty good at it. Chemistry, a little, a little better, but it's more complex. And then the biologicals, the that's really been the challenge. And uh, and so I think that also pulled me into, um, uh, well, to to where I am now. But you know, soils really complex. How do you measure that? The DNA technology was was coming out, and um, and so I thought, well, that's you know the direction I want to go. So. Um, so I was, yeah, you know, that was cool. I was teaching and I was doing this research, kind of traveling around, writing up. It wasn't really research. Yeah. It was fun. I was interacting with researchers, but I think that was part of it. Like I, I did feel myself drifting away from. You were left out. <laughs> yeah, from doing the science. I was talking about the science and learning about the science, but I, I, I wanted to get involved a little bit. Yeah, Don Natkid, not Don Natvig was there, so I, I would visit him a little bit, you know, trying to get my keep keep my uh, mycological connection. Is that New Mexico or New yeah. Mexico State? No, yeah. that was New Mexico uh, University, yeah. of New Mexico, yeah. in Albuquerque. Yeah. So you got back to Duke. You got to do. Yeah, so that was the oh, actually nearby. That's amazing because all your schooling's kind of right in there. Yeah, yeah. So I had gone to a meeting to present my tech, my, uh, my my work, um, and uh, Omani Zukelman was giving a talk on some of his, um, you know, applied mycology, and I had I had chatted with him. I had known him a, a, a bit from you know my mom would clip articles and send them to me oh. and stuff. So my mom was always kind of supportive of when she knew I was interested in fungi. Mm -hmm. And so when there was something that she thinks I would like, she'd send it to me. What yeah. was her background? Um, my mom um, was a teacher. Oh. Yeah, so she was an immigrant. She came to the country when she was 13 Where? Um, from Portugal. Oh. And, um, and, yeah. She, what did she teach? She was a foreign language teacher. She was uh, a loved teaching French. Mm -hmm. uh, she taught Spanish. Um, and then... Uh, they ended up having her teach health at some point because there wasn't health teachers, and uh, she wasn't very fond of that. But uh, she still did it. Still did it. But um, but she must have had some interest in science, or maybe just interest in you. She had a lot of interest in science and promoting that in our lives. I remember getting you know rainforest books, and my, my brother you know coral reef stuff. My brother ended up being a coral reef 
biologist, oh. you know, and um, my other brother's an artist, but she was always promoting uh, the, the natural world and, um, and, and travel and uh, th these sorts of things trying to... Um, so how did you come to hitting on truffles as a topic for your PhD? Yeah, right. So that's a good question uh, by a little bit, but as a fluke. But, um, you know, so part of it was, so I went to Duke, you know, um, applied, it's the only place I applied to work with Redis and, and work in collaboration with Oban to do some sort of applied uh, mycology project. And I wasn't sure what that would entail. Um, one of the projects I was really interested in compost and the microbial ecology involved in, in composting because there's a you know the succession and you know, trying to th um, but uh, but my uh, my site uh, I was I was working at the um, the city um, compost facility and it ended up one day I woke up it was really smoky outside like what's what's going on. You know, and um, end, ended up the uh, the compost facility was on had caught fire. It had spontaneously combusted. Wow. You know, so I guess, and, and you know, working there, it was not. It was very high. There was a lot of methane accumulation. Yeah, and it turns out, and it smoldered for a week or more. And it turns out they were operating without a permit. And, um, and so that kind of could put a kibosh on, <laughs> on the job on that project. But it was cool because there was a lot of candida, a lot of uh, yeast and candida tropicalis in particular, a lot of pathogens early on that were um, living on the wood and the materials. So probably maybe in association with insects or birds or I don't know when they came in. But yeah, they and I don't know if you ever knew John Haynes. He was in New York State. He was there, uh, my college. Yeah, he was at the New York State Museum yeah. in but Albany. He was involved with, with, well, I don't know if it was rubbish heaps or composting or what, but there was an Aspergillus fumigatus problem. And that's the one that can get into your lungs and has very small spores. So these compost heaps can be a problem, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, and I never realized how hot they got until I lived in Michigan and one snowy day I took the dog out and I sat on the compost pile because there was no snow. And ah, <laughs> warm, <you're laughs> warm. It's the warm spot in Michigan yeah. winter, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, so that was, that project went up in flames, you know. Quite, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but on the side I had been getting, you know, tr uh, truffle trees sent to Redis's lab, you know, you come in, Redis, Hey, would you mind looking at the mycorrhizas here? Can you know? So, so we would, you know, I think uh, people had been sending them trees for a while, and um, and we would find tubers. What do you mean by tree? Oh, the seedlings. Oh, oh, oh they get seedlings. seedlings. Oh. Yeah. So, so people wanted to grow truffles oh, in North okay. Carolina because of um, there was this tobacco resettlement money, and uh, they were going to turn tobacco farmers into truffle farmers. You know, that was the idea, and so. All these uh, tobacco farmers, you know, started planting truffle trees from, um, you know, a number of different sources. But we always uh, was right. They wanted to know where their truffles on our seedlings, you know, before we plant or after they plant right. sometimes. And so we get these samples in and Redis would find a student. Hey, can you? And I was doing these, uh, you know, and we would find um, mycorrhizas and we'd find tuber. But it was not tuber melanosporum in most cases. Um, which is what they expected or had inoculated or... That's right, that's what they had paid for, right? Uh -huh. And so they're putting in uh, 10 years and 100,000 plus dollars, and so they want to be growing tuber melanosporum. And what we were finding is, uh, you're getting all these, um, you know, probably native species that come in into the lime soils, but no one, uh, we didn't know what they were because they weren't identified in GenBank. Um, and so uh, I, I, I called Jim Trappy and I was like, um, Jim, this is, I'm Greg Benito, I'm a student in Redis's lab, I'm really interested in tuber, and I, you know, I was telling my, pro, uh, you know, my other project kind of fell out, and I was thinking I could, you know, maybe I could work on systematics of tuber, and I know you've done a lot of work in that area, would you mind uh, collaborating with me? And, and, and he's a great collaborator, isn't he? Oh, he was phenomenal. Oh, he said, I've been trying to get a student to work on this for years. Uh, I would, I would love to work with you. Oh, it was excellent. Yeah, and so uh, every year for the next three years, I'd go out there for a month, work wow. with Jim. Um, so he was really a, a great mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, I brother. didn't realize that. 
Yeah, yeah, and so that was good. I got to visit Joey too, and all the mycologists out yeah. there. It's a great spot. But but Jim was Jim was awesome. So he you know, he had had a little you know he had an extra room. So you know. Oh, was, he even put you up. He put me up. We made we ate together, made meals, and we did some field work, and we'd go into the their herbarium and work on collections. I, you know, did a lot of DNA extractions and sampling and, and uh, microscopy. Um, and so, uh, and then we wrote a grant, you know, to, uh, with Redis to do the systematics of, uh, of tuberaceae in North America. And that, that was funded. It was a small grant, but it, it funded us to go to Mexico for three years. Wow. For, uh, we did two week trips. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where the keep on truffling shirt came yeah. from. That was like we had a little bit of money left in the grant, you know, and we had I, I have one of them. Oh, okay. I never saw it. So where in Mexico did you go? Um, we went to Monterrey. Uh, we went to De Efe and Veracruz. And then we went to Guadalajara. Those are the three. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah, it, it was good. We tried to go to different areas yeah. so we could we could sample. And every, almost every spot we got tuber. Um, we had, um, you know, and Efren Cazares uh, went with us. He was our kind of helped organize it. Jim came on every trip. Redis came, um, and we had collaborators down there. Roseanne Healy came uh, one year. Matt Smith came the first year. Um, Todd Elliott came another year. So. It was really phenomenal. We got a lot of great, great collections, new species. Um, so that was part of, you know, North America is not just the United States, right? So we wanted right. to make sure we had <laughs> Mexico included and Canada, you know, we included as well. Although we didn't foray up there, we did work on collections from there. Well, you know, there, there have been questions with the Mycological Society of America uh, when people wanted to nominate Mexicans for distinguished mycologists, uh, not this, uh, for the foreign myco correspondent mycologists, and that's for foreign members or non non members foreign, and you know it was a problem because Mexico should be considered North America, yeah. but I, I think we have a few people that were were corresponding members as an honor, so. Guzman yeah, Guzman. Uh, but there's always been this tendency to think of the U.S. as the the hub. Yeah, yeah. And so these meetings, for example, that are out, uh, you know, in Canada, and mm -hmm. I don't know that we've had a meeting in Mexico. We've never had a meeting in Mexico. But uh, the opening up and mm -hmm. bringing those people in has been a big, yeah. big part of I it. I remember a number of years ago. Uh, Mary Palm had uh, brought in a number of people, uh, people from Mexico, but also Central America, yeah. I think, for some yeah. reason. But so Tuber turned out to be a big project, didn't it? That's a lifetime project yeah, for many, many people, yeah, yeah. It's ongoing, yeah. yeah. So uh, after you, you finished your PhD with Tuber, what happens? Um, yeah, what happens, you know, so I, I, I did a postdoc and, um, and uh, you know, during my PhD I had a child, we had a house, you know, we were a little kind of pretty, pretty set and I'd been advised, you know, you don't want to work with the same, you know, you need to change labs, learn new skills. Uh, I had actually got a fellowship to work on Candida, I was going to work on medical mycology and the Duke Medical Mycology Unit with John Perfect. Um, and at the same time, Redis uh, had got this um, DOE money to work on poplar microbiome. And, um, and so I, I ended up just staying where I was um, working with Redis. And my, my, my rationale was I, was I, I, I liked it there. It, it was things were working out. New project means I can learn new skills develop more back into kind of environmental microbiology, which is, um, you know, where I had a, a natural uh, interest as well. Um, so that was a great project. And, I, and that was three years? That was three years, yeah, that was three years. And then, um, uh, you know, then I had some, you know, my, my mom had passed away. My mom passed away, and uh, at the same time, I had applied for this position in Australia, 
And it all happened kind of, you know, she passed away before we left, which was, which was um, you know, uh, kind of a blessing because there was, you know, her suffering was done and, uh, and, and I was there, you know, and I didn't leave her behind, which would have been very you know, difficult. Uh, so, um, and so I went to um, Australia for a year. I, I left Duke and to be the mycologist at R Royal Botanic Garden. Uh, filling in for Teresa LaBelle, who had went to New Zealand to, to uh, you know, to finish up some of Ross Beaver's uh, work, because uh, he, he had passed away. So it's these backfill positions in Australia was great. And it was like, um, um, uh, just to leave everything behind and to recenter with the family. You know, we had, you know, we had a suitcase each, you know, just, it was really, uh, um, just cleansing uh, and start over. Mm -hmm. Start over and um, and uh, you know so we did a bunch of um, yeah in Australia you know it's nine to five you know with with tea in between and and, and, and lunch and you know so it's a little bit of a different mentality different work ethic um, and uh, and so I was I was staying late at first <laughs> and I was like what am I doing? <laughs> If I'm going to be in Australia, I, I do it like the Aussies do it. Uh, so, uh, but but it was great, and we did a lot of collecting. We went to the the Northern Territory on a on a big foray. Pretty soon after I arrived, for for two weeks, we collected over 300 specimen, which is uh, double what had been collected there originally. And we got a lot of fleshy fungi um, that. Um, and we went to New Zealand, so part of it was just, you know, trying, trying to do um, inventories, you know, macrofungal inventories. And what, what a wonderful, uh, diverse place to be able to do that. I mean, what you saw was uh, pretty fantastic. Yeah, you know, some things look similar and some things were very different. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever see snakes, bad snakes? I didn't. I didn't see any snakes while I was there. I know Australia is, you know, full of things that'll kill you, right? I was uh, only in in Queensland, uh, what two weeks, and I saw a taipan. Oh yeah. It went right in front of me. I was sitting in the front seat of a jeep, and it went right in front. It's just scary. I'm, I'm scared of snakes anyway oh, yeah. from collecting. I've almost got bitten by water moccasins. They could be aggressive. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And so I, I've always. You know, ap I wasn't as a child, but later I was scared of snakes. And when that taipan came across the road, I just couldn't believe it. It could be big too, right? It 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 was the width of the road, and it was uh, of the length of the width of the road. <laughs> In length, yeah. I just yeah, I'd been on Flinders Island. I'd seen pythons before, mm -hmm. but uh, but while I was there a year, we did a lot of field work. I didn't see I didn't see snakes, you know, surprisingly, and. Uh, yeah. So. So you were in Australia, but you came back. Yeah, I was there like a week before I had left. You know, Mark Mark Hubertus said, "Oh, there's this position at Michigan State. Really think you should apply." <laughs> and uh, I, 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 he twisted my arm. I didn't really want to apply there. I don't know. I don't know uh, because I, you know, never really spent much time in Michigan. It's my wife says it's a flyover state. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you spent time in Michigan, you know. I, I like it now, but uh, yeah, so Mark. Does Mark, she like it? Um, She's getting know, used to it. Um, you know, she loved Australia. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, you know, so, uh, so Cubetta, you know, convinced me to apply. And so I was there a few weeks and I got this call. Hey, you know, really like your application. Uh, you, we want to have you come in to, to this position. So they flew me back. Uh, for an interview. Wow. They were very interested if they flew you from Australia. Yeah, well, it was before uh, the COVID, and they probably uh, would have just zoomed me in, yeah, well. you know, these days. Yeah. Yeah, I think now there will be fewer of these trips because they'll have learned about Zoom. <laughs> yeah, but it's unfortunate. I mean, Zoom's great, but you yeah. if I had Zoomed, I might not have gone because I think going there and seeing the facilities and you know, like Tim was there, I got to connect with him, like, well, you know, a little bit about Michigan and the mycology there. And so 
being in person, I think it's better. For Could I have oh, a great birthday party you came to? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, so there's some wonderful things like that, right? Yeah. But, but we, you know, uh, you weren't buying a house via Zoom, you know, and <laughs> right? There's just some things in person, especially when it's a big life-changing thing. Yeah. That you want oh, yeah, no, no, to suss it out. So, uh, so, yeah, so that's how that happened. And, um, and so I actually had more time in Australia, and I was able to delay my start date mm -hmm. a, a bit, but um, ended up leaving it. it it was hard, but I didn't have a permanent position in, in Australia, and um, there's not that many mycology oh, positions. It was it's like, all right, I might, maybe I'll open a brewery, uh, you know, make a mushroom farm. I don't know what am I going to do? Consult, uh, yeah. be a truffle farmer. That maybe you know like that that could have been a good route. Exotic <laughs> truffles. Yeah, well, they grow a lot now. As you know, I mean, it was it was it was really going big when I was there. They had. Um, 10 to 15 tons, you know, the numbers are, you know, never, not always reported accurately, but they were becoming very productive. Yeah, big um, deal. And, and so, but, you know, I was still, you know, a poor, you know, I wasn't a grad student anymore, but it's not like I had a lot of money to buy land and, yeah. and equipment. So back, you end up in Michigan and uh, you've, you've done lots of different things since you've been in uh, research directions. And uh, the Morels, for example, you want to talk about your Morel work a little bit? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, so I'm, I'm in a, uh, an, it's an agricultural school, right? So we do have to focus a little bit on, on foods and, and crops and things. I guess we can do whatever we want as long as we're getting funding. But, uh, but yeah, more else, so that, that, that's the Morel work started when I went to China. So I got invited to go to, uh, to China uh, to work on truffles, actually, uh, because there's a whole, you know, China, there's a lot of endemic species and a lot of diversity. And while I was there, um, I had heard about, you know, the cultivation of morels there. And I, was, and I had talked to Francois, uh, Francis Martin about it. And he's like, oh, yeah, it's real. Because you know, I'd only seen pictures, right? And uh, so I, I and, and this was happening at uh, folks at the Kunming Institute were, I mean, it's happening in Sichuan as well. But uh, there were people there. And so I, I asked uh, Fu Cheng, uh, um, uh, you, uh, Hey, can I? I want to. I want to see this, and so I was able to go see what they were doing and talk to folks that were doing it, and uh, and so that's that's kind of how the Morel uh, cultivation work started. I, and there was there was another uh, fellow in the lab who was in, interested in mushroom cultivation and Morels, and so we had done projects before. Uh, you know, are they are they mycorrhizal or not? We would fight about that. You yeah. know. It's, Still not clear to me. Uh, sometimes, yeah, I, when you read and hear people, uh, are they or aren't they? But yeah. what do you think? I think not. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, that's you know. So, so we had we set up experiments with apples and elms and um, I don't know what else we had. Uh, um, ash, you know, and we inoculated him with a bunch of things, and he was growing them up, and he didn't find any. There were no mycorrhizas, and he didn't even really find too many uh, endophytes in the roots. But they grew. Well, the the oh. plants grew. Oh, yeah. The, the fungi grew, but they didn't fruit. The yeah, the morels grew, but they didn't fruit. And uh, and so you know, going to China, I saw kind of what they were doing, and uh, and essentially, it's um, you know the nutrient packs is one of the big things. So you gotta. You know, you put the spawn in, you let it colonize the soil, and then quickly, you know, you feed it. Um, and then the fungus grows in the nutrient packs, takes all the nutrients, cellulitic things, and then goes into the soil and makes sclerotia, make, you know, they canidiate. Um, but the canidi, yeah. Um, yeah, so the canidia is another thing that was, I was interested in the morels because they would produce canidia. And so Roseanne Healy and Matt Smith and I, you know, uh, largely probably talking to you with the canidia, you turned them on to this, so tuber makes these asexual states, and we, no one knows like what they, what they, what's their role in, in our, our, we thought they might be spermatia. Yeah, well many of them don't germinate. 
they don't germinate. You put them on media and they, they don't germinate. I tried doing inoculations with pachyfoides and these others and um, they didn't make mycorrhizas. Yeah, it, it's, it's a mystery. Uh, and, you know, you, you look at these life cycles that people have created for morels, for example, there's always this dotted line around the, uh, these conidia, spermatia, mitospores. Mm. Um, How big are they? Diameter? One to two microns. So they're tiny. Yeah, they're tiny and they're prolific and they always make them before they, they fruit. They're always there. Not always a lot. And but you can collect them in the wild too. Mm -hmm. You know, you go out and you find this patch and you, you can pick them up and take them back, look at them. I mean, I, I, it was years of seeing these things and thinking, oh, that's some corticioid, you know, it's, uh, what is it? And then you realize you look at this and you, you get things like um, Pisiza mitospores, you get morels, you get uh, Dicinus, uh, yeah, gyromitris. All of them are doing a sa similar kind of pattern and you can, if you know how to look, you find them. Roseanne is the person who's so good at picking those up. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So that actually was what kind of spurred on the, the morel because, uh, you know, tuber makes them, but how am I going to test if they're spermatia? So well, that's it. You're, you're, you're kind of stuck with this life, you know, manipulating a life. Uh, so, with, so with Morcella, you can because you can type your strains because they're heterothallic. You know, you got mating type 1, mating type 2. And we've been, this is how it started, actually. We were trying to, like, collect the spermatia, put them on the other mating type to demonstrate whether you get fruiting or not. Yeah. Um, but it's been hard because the indoor systems are, are challenging. We've had fruiting with... Um, just one mating type, which was confusing. Uh, I have a hard time explaining that. Um, it wasn't, you know, they weren't ascospores produced. But, um, yeah, so morels have a funny kind of thing going yeah, on. Yeah, there's something. Um, so that was, that was part of it was, uh, you know, having a system where you could test the role of these, of these um, I, I still think they're, We'll call them mitospores. Mitospores. That, uh, Roseanne and I, uh, Roseanne did, Roseanne Healy did uh, a paper on the, these mitosporic spore mats. Mm -hmm. You know, we tossed around, what are you going to call these? You know, you call them conidia, it sounds like there's a function that goes along with it. I uh, call it spermatia, but you don't know, you know, so what's the uh, terminology? It's got to be mitospore, which is neutral, um, but uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, we, we all have a Southern South American morel paper that I took the lead on, but uh, many of the records, distribution records, are based on spore mats that we collected. Mm -hmm. So, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, you, you know. had anything else. Well, the spore mats are in the, there, they're in the fall, and the morels are in the spring, mm -hmm. the fruiting bodies, yeah. yeah. But that, that's an aside. You do other things. What about mor Mortiorella? Yeah, what about it? Uh, another cool soil fungus, I mean, that's always there and, uh, and really diverse. Yeah, so uh, that started during my postdoc, you know, the Mortirella, that was, um, we had uh, through the PMI project in Redis's lab, uh, Francis Martin said, you guys can sequence three genomes. And so we're like, well, what are we going to do, you know, and so we wanted one ASCO, one Basid, and one Zygo, you know, so how do you pick it, you know, so they had to be things that were associated with our sites. And the, the goal was really to do forest soil meta, metagenomics, metatranscriptomics. Um, but it was, it was hard to do because there were not good references um, for, for, for fungi. And most of the time, you, you, you sequence the soil, you get bacteria. So for eukaryotes, if you do transcriptomics, then, then you can really hone in on the fungi and other eukaryotes. And so, um, so we wanted to find, there was another project in the lab uh, the, 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 at the face site or the, um, uh, the dimensions of biodiversity. And so Mortirella elongata was one species that was like, 
across both projects and was there and we had a, an isolate of um, you know from one of the sites of interest and uh, and so we did um, a track diella was the basidio um, 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 Forgetting the uh, the ASCO that we did, um, uh, one it's not Neo Satoria, Neo Neo Nectria was the um, uh, Elio Nectria was the was the ASCO that we did, and then uh, Mortarella was the was the um, the Zygo, and uh, so that was the first genome, um, but uh, but it, it was actually the, the second too because they told us. Uh, um, uh, by the way, we also assembled the endosymbiont genome, you know, of our isolate. So we were lucky that we uh, actually, with Andre Gergansky, isolated it, but it was carrying this bacterial endosymbiont, uh, Burkholderia relative now, called Mycoavitis. And so that, that kind of got us very excited about this idea of bacteria living within fungi and the early diverging fungi, you know, with having you know, and and, uh, and so that's been kind of an area of research ever since that I've been I've been working on, um, and and Mortarell is still a mystery. Like, what is it doing? It's it's the most dominant thing in the soil when you when you sequence. Um, it's very. It, it must be doing something. Uh, that's funny. You said it's very very common. Uh, I'm interested in in Lobosporangium. It's in that group. And that's been found three times in two year period and never found again. Yeah, and you found it right outside your building, right? It was right outside, you know, three feet from the the building, the bo the botany building at the University of Texas. Just in the soil or what? It, yeah. it was in dust. It was in dust. But David and Alec found it in Nevada and Francis Renzoni found it in Sonora, Mexico. But both uh, in very dry places. Yeah, that's a wild yeah. fungus. I was hoping that someone would find it in uh, in zygolite, you know. I thought, gosh, it'll show up now. We tried, <laughs> yeah. It's not for lack of trying. Uh, uh, well, Lobosporangium has a molecule related endosymbiont, you know. I, I don't know if it was your culture or... No, you, 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 I think you used Malik's culture. Yeah, okay. Mine and Malik's are in ATCC. So it had been, um, it, I don't, what year did he collect that? Let's see, I, I got mine and uh, was the first or second year I'd started grad school. So it was late uh, 60 sometime, I think. I'm not sure what, what year he finished his degree, but it was a year before he finished. Yeah, so this isolate was 60 years old. I mean, it had been preserved, but, uh, yeah. but it still carried this endosymbiont, which is pretty, pretty wild. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, it's an amazing fungus. Dr. Alex looked at it and said, looks like insect eggs, try to grow it. <laughs> you know, it's macroscopic. The fruiting bodies are ma macroscopic, the sprains you. Yeah, you, know? you could see yeah, Oh, yeah, and they form clusters of eight. So you can certainly see the cultures. <laughs> and so you just, is that a, like a dust sprinkle or soil yeah, sprinkle exactly. method? Yeah. Never found it again. I, I went out there again and again and again. It was, I knew exactly where I got. See, sometimes you're just lucky, right? There's yeah, just so much. So lucky. Yeah. Well, I, I think since these are mycological history and we're kind of looking at... Uh, uh, we, we got off on our little... No, no. I, I, I think <laughs> it's important for maybe for you to reflect a little bit on uh, you know, you, you've had this career of moving around, having to make all sorts of choices. What, what would you say to a, or what do you say to your graduate students about a pathway? A pathway? Uh, yeah. I, I, I say they, uh, you know, need to decide for themselves. I think, um, I think everyone's got a lot of factors in their life, and I think it's good to take chances. I think you want to do what you know really you're excited about and follow your passion and I think that you know it's even if it's a harder path it's usually a much more rewarding path and, and, and you don't know where you'll end up but you might surprise yourself it could be you know I think but they're the best ones to decide that right you know but, and <laughs> but that there is no right way there's no right way, no. And some of the, uh, we, you know, 
when there's a fork in the road, take it. Yeah. I mean, especially if you like to explore, or you make you make opportunities for yourself. I mean, that's that's part of it. And so you're making your own path. The path isn't necessarily being made for you. And so you know, um, but there's always hard decisions, you yeah. know, that come up. You know, all of us have gone through that. I mean, I was with. Should I do a master's in ecology or go into my college, you know, ecology or mycology for me, you know, or going, you know, moving to New Mexico was a life thing, going to Australia or staying where I was, applying for a job or not, you know, and sometimes yeah. it took, like, I wouldn't have applied if, if Mark wasn't like, Greg, I really think you should consider this, yeah. you know, so, so listening to others is important, you know, not that you need to take all the advice, but it's a really important to listen. Um, and um, well, talking about listening, there's one thing you haven't mentioned about your life, and uh, that's music. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We started out talking about that because one of the first times I ever met you, I saw you playing music. So, what do you do now? Do you do you have opportunities? Um, I still play music. That's just part of who I am. Uh, and, but I, I don't have a good, um, I play music with my son, yeah. is uh, who I play music with the most now. What, what instrument? Um, he plays piano and drums. Oh. You know, so uh, we got, before COVID, we got a little Gretsch uh, Catalina kit, a little four piece mm -hmm. drum set that's really nice. And he's really taken to that. Um, and he plays a little jazz piano. So, so sometimes I can convince him to play with me, you know, uh, you know, maybe a, a couple times a week if I'm lucky. Uh, I, I play on my own. Uh, but okay. since COVID hit, you know, it really kind of knocked a lot of the music out of my life. And, and you might not have found new people to play with other than your son. I, I know you used to play with Rita. So. Yeah, that was great. We used to play almost every week. You know, we had the, we even played with our, our um, Dave Swafford, you know. Uh, you played in a pizza parlor, didn't you? Um, or were you? We paid. Was it pizza? No, well, it was a brew, brew place. Okay. We played it. Uh, we used to do kind of, um, you know, in um, some uh, senior centers over the holidays. We would sometimes do little, sh little shows. But uh, yeah, but it was mostly for fun. So, any any parting thoughts? It's an exciting time to be a mycologist. I, I, I don't know what your guys' perspective is. It, it seems like there's a resurgence. There's a lot of interest in new ma materials as well as biodiversity. We're still scratching the surface. Yeah. And it's been interesting for us. I'm sure for Don, as, as I feel about it, you know, we grew up with morphology and that's all we had. And we couldn't go very deep because there were, you know, there were just not enough characters to use. But yeah. Like well, it, and I think it's for for me, and I'm sure for Meredith more more so for Meredith, but to have had the transition of the morphology, and you know, I I love morphology. I love to look at fungi. I love to study them and try to figure I out the the morphology of of these. But then the transition through the molecular sequencing era into now where genomics and all sorts of other questions, it's really exciting. And yeah. you can ask questions that you'd only kind of hypothesize about before. You know, what is this fungus doing? You know, I'm collecting this, I see it, I know where it is, but what is it doing? And now you've got a chance at that. The downside is, that the morphology end of it that I feel is still important uh, kind of is dropping off. People aren't as competent to be able to look at fungi and analyze and work them in the same way. And that can lead to some real issues, I think. But, mm -hmm. but it, it's a fun, exciting time. Yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I just can't imagine why people were ever resistant to and you had to talk about molecules or morphology, you know. <laughs> you gotta do both. Yeah. You think it'll come back around to the morphology? I mean, one thing I like with the genomic era is now there is a, a push towards like living fungi and having living cultures and trying to trying to understand their life history a little bit yeah. more. Yeah, I, yeah I, no, and, and you know, you might 
Well, when I, I worked with some people, a bunch of people on yeast genomes, and, and sometimes they didn't do what the genes told you they might do, you know, and, and so you don't know what the expression was. So those sorts of things might be really important yeah. sometimes. So there's a need for cultures, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and from, you know, the collection angle, being a curator, uh, the fact that with molecular techniques you can begin to dig back into collections and use them in a way that you, you wouldn't have thought of mm -hmm. before. So it, it, it really is very exciting and, and synthetic in a way that it, what, it couldn't be before. Are, are there footprints of the mycologists who were there before you? Well, actually, my, my advisor, C.J. Alexopoulos, was at Michigan State at one time. Uh, also, uh, well, there were some medical mycologists who weren't there. Beneke. Uh, uh, Beneke. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, there was another person, too. There were, there were several people I can remember. But probably... Not much memory now, because uh, it was a botany department then. Yeah, it's um, yeah. Memory is not always so deep. Mm -hmm. You inspire me, Meredith. I want to do like a, a mycology of M M Michigan State. You know, something about them. All the mycologists that have been there, because um, um, there 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 have been a lot, um, and and there's still a lot now that are that are there. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we might call them plant pathologists, but you know, we got Francis yeah. Trail and yeah. Marty yeah. Chilvers and uh, Mary Hausbeck and Tim Miles. I mean, we have a lot and, and, and there always have been folks. Um, Bessie was there. Yeah, yeah. E EA. Yeah, that's, yeah. EA Bessie. Yeah.